Okay, I think um, it's, we're now sort of six past the hour. So um, hopefully te all technical difficulties aside, we're ready to kick off. Um, so let me start by um, first, first of all, I want to wel welcome you all um, to the first of the Data Done Done webinar series that we at Versant will be hosting over the coming months. Um, we've had a lot of interest from many of our customers and from people across the industry on how we approach the delivery of data platforms for our customers. And in particular, how we adapt our core skills of automation and DevOps to data. Um, the webinars will be seeking to answer some of these questions and, and hopefully deep dive on topics such as how we approach migrations of data platforms onto AWS, how we design data platforms that support data ops right from the outset, um, and also some of the best practices around how we approach data lakes, warehousing, business intelligence, um, Snowflake integration, real-time analytic processing, um, security for data, as well as a range of other topics. Um, to, details on today's and future webinars will be posted on our website um, over the course of the next few weeks, um, as well as a range of other channels like LinkedIn or, or via email. So, so keep an eye out for those if you're interested in attending some of these sessions into the future. So let's kick up today's session with uh, what we'll be covering and what makes a done done analytics platform. What we mean by done done essentially is a platform that's ready to meet your end users requirements and scale as the needs evolve. During today's session, we'll talk to you um, about how we go about defining and designing the elements of these platforms to ensure that the final solution remains not only low cost, but flexible enough to respond to the increasing pace of change within today's business environments. We also have a great case study to share with you, highlighting how we partnered with one of our more innovative customers, Fix Technology, to build out their new data platform and transform the way they deliver insights to their customers. So that should be a really exciting uh, um, segue sort of about in about 20 minutes in. And finally, we'll aim to give you some time to ask any questions that you may have of um, the presenters um, towards the end of the session. Um, on the topic of presenters, today we'll have myself, I'm David Hannes, I'm the Technical Director for Data here at Versant. Um, my role is essentially to help customers take advantage of the opportunities that cloud um, offers for their data platforms and solutions that they're seeking to implement. Um, we're also fortunate enough to be joined by Sean Langton, who's the CTO of VIX Technology, to talk about the exciting journey we have been on together um, over the past six months, as well as showcase some of the outcomes that were delivered for the VIX business um, uh, in, the, you know, in the last couple of months. And finally, Phil Hampton, who's our principal engineer for data in Perth. Um, he, Phil was instrumental in the design and build of the solution for VIX, and will be here to answer any of the more technical questions um, that you may have for us at the end of the, um, towards the end of the session. Um, so at Versant, uh, we know that many of you today are focused on how you drive better outcomes and value for your businesses. Over and over again, we see one of the key steps is simply getting your data foundations right, and in, most importantly, putting yourselves in a position to quickly deliver outcomes for your business. So to make things easier for you, we're looking to make things easier for those of you looking to get an outcome a little bit quicker. We've pulled together an offer that hopefully aims to get your data platform in place in as little as 13 weeks, and importantly, offers your business um, the opportunity to deliver a real tangible outcome as soon as the um, we're actually really excited about this offer um, and at the end of the webinar we'll be posting some links um, on how you can get in touch with us to not only um, take advantage of the offer but also get a free data done done diagnostic um, where we sit down with you and um, your business to understand your ready readiness to, to essentially begin um, your cloud journey or hopefully begin your cloud transformation if you've already got a web presence um, on AWS or, or in cloud. So a little bit more on that a little um, later. Um, so um, on the topic of what does it mean, what do, um, what do we mean when we talk about a modern serverless data platform that's done done? Um, first and foremost, it's cloud-based. Um, and you can see from the diagram here that there's not a lot in it. And typically when you do sort of um, make your move into cloud, um, you know, you're sort of faced with a lot of decisions around the types of tools and the types of services that you need to implement to, to basically manage your specific workloads. Um, and there's a huge amount of um, variability in, or a huge amount on offer um, to be able to support, um, to support sort of the solution requirements for each um, different businesses. Um, one of the key advantages of cloud is obviously that um, it contains a lot of serverless um, components 
Um, and by serverless, essentially, we mean components that can be consumed and used without you having to actively um, look after or manage those workloads, which is a massive cost saving for a lot of businesses who are currently struggling or battling with um, managing infrastructure as opposed to focusing on delivering the outcomes. Um, the services are also um, in cloud becoming increasing, increasingly more flexible in how they can be consumed, which is a huge benefit for data that typically tends to be um, subject to quite variable workloads and consequently um, very light, heavy spikes in demand for, um, for resources at particular times of, of the month or, um, or weeks, which can mean um, sizing and managing infrastructure becomes even, um, even a bigger issue. Cloud has also become, that also um, allows for the seamless blending of real-time and batch architectures, which previously have been extraordinarily difficult to do at scale. These days, real-time analytic processes can be quickly embedded into the solution architecture and enable businesses to dramatically improve the timeliness of their analytics and achieve real-time decision-making for their operations. And finally, and in my opinion, probably the most important um, is the ability to easily extend these architectures to be able to cater for a wide range of different use cases. Most modern data platforms are no longer bound to um, the typical finance or operational, um, I guess, use cases. They're now flexible and scalable enough to be able to provide a whole of business solution um, for, for the data needs, whether it be um, obviously supporting some of the uh, traditional finance or operational use cases or delivering um, real, uh, real changes in the way you deliver customer experience or optimize operations across the business. Um, this offers businesses a real alternative to how they run their data operating models now and into the future. What it means essentially is that companies now have the right capabilities at hand minus the hurdle costs to be able to innovate at pace um, and at the pace that's currently demanded by business and their customers. Services can be easily provisioned um, to test new ideas and prove out um, idea, these ideas at low cost before significant scale up is required um, in terms of investment. Importantly, you can also leverage the right tool for the right job. Um, gone are the days where everything bad, everything had to be done um, on one Oracle database instance that everyone shared. You can now provision a range of different services, whether it be a glue cluster or an EMR cluster um, to be able to support some long, long running transformational jobs. You can use Kinesis to quickly modify real-time schemas um, and run inference over your, uh, over your um, inbound data sets. You can scale up Redshift or Snowflake warehouses to meet end of, the, end of month um, demands and requirements, as well as um, spin up services such as SageMaker to be able to run some fairly quick and effective machine learning experiments um, to be able to hopefully automate aspects of your business. The days, um, the, the historic days where the inherent constraints that were um, uh, available in the past um, due to the one tool to rule them all approaches is now well and truly behind us. And because of this, developers and engineers are now, um, now have the tools at hand to be able to deliver the right outcomes. They no longer have to live with the specter of, um, of effectively implementing technical debt and living with that going um, relatively low cost. A huge benefit from this is that most that at the moment a lot of business and engineering teams um, have lots of sideline skills and the more flexible architectures allow those skill sets to move away from focusing on um, managing infrastructure and rationing scarce compute resources. Instead they're now freed up to work alongside the business to um, pursue value adds. This is a huge transformation for many data teams and has been um, who have been traditionally placed in a position of saying no too many times to new opportunities because there simply isn't enough capacity to get through the maintenance and management activities as well as respond to business requirements. At Versant, we feel this is um, truly transformational. It puts a lot of businesses who have sort of taken a step into cloud um, in a position where they can finally overcome the velocity gap that's been building within their organizations. And in order to help them do this more effectively, we've been focusing on providing a set of established patterns to reduce architectural decision-making um, and focus instead on leveraging best practices to quickly move from, from design through to implementation and outcome.
because we're often engaged to support what we deliver, we also understand the critical importance of applying DevOps processes to these patterns to ensure fast and reliable change cycles are in place to avoid the trap of eroding confidence in the data platform that can occur when you have issues crop up such as ETL job failures or failures um, of warehouse loads or just unavailable resources to be able to complete the analytic activities required. Um, in order to be able to do all this, we like to work with our clients to bring together uh, using a process that we call the Yellow Brick Road. The Yellow Brick Road goes through what we consider to be the five key dimensions of strategy and governance, architecture, data ops, data management, and ongoing optimizations of those platforms by ensuring that all the priorities are aligned so that the organization can get the most from their data platform. Without a cohesive approach to all these factors, we find companies tend to stall on their transformation journey. So we aim to get the strategy right from the outset and provide a clear path from today to the desired outcomes. The Yellow Brick Road helps customers ask questions like, do you need a data lake or don't you need a data lake? Data lakes um, are increasingly becoming a cornerstone of, the mod of a modern data architecture. But if not done right, they can typically, they can um, run the risk of missing their objective um, due to the effort involved in managing and curating data within them. For many organizations, key data assets are more transactional in nature and not simply append only. And we've seen organizations fall into the trap of using data lakes um, as de facto RDBMSs um, just due to the nature of their data. To avoid that, we try to um, consider upfront what is the right tool for the right job. And if an RDBMS or a variant of that is not the right tool, um, for your um, specific data aggregation needs, then our recommendation is simply not to use it. And we aim to sort of tease that out through this um, process. The objective is always to avoid over-engineering the outcome and focus on implementing a proven um, pattern rather than leaving yourself uh, and, put, and putting organizations in a um, position to have a clear path to scale up as and when required. Another principle we like to consider closely as part of the YBR process is matching, man, matching workloads um, to needs and budget. Consumption um, in cloud, if not managed um, closely, can quickly become a fairly serious problem for many um, organizations due to the lumpy, da lumpy consumption patterns that, um, again, we typically see on data platforms. Over-provisioning or under-provisioning um, upfront can lead to um, some really uh, interesting trade-offs for many organizations um, that can also affect the customer and user experience on those platforms. We aim to mitigate this by selecting the right tools up front and that's part of the YBR process. For example, there are many amazing um, warehousing solutions available at the moment um, from both AWS and um, other SaaS partners out there such as Snowflake. Both provide very compelling value propositions to traditional compute solutions but choosing which one needs to be in place to balance off a number of factors is typically not a simple um, decision. Snowflake, for instance, is perfectly suited to variable workloads. Its, it's decoupled storage and compute architecture can offer extremely flexible and cost-effective um, compute services, as you'll see a little uh, shortly in the, when we walk through the VIX use case. So for staggered or highly diverse workloads, it provides a simple solution that often requires less component and improves um, to, um, and ultimately allows them to innovate at faster speed. However, that's not to discount traditional solutions or solutions that are available on AWS at the moment, such as Redshift, which recently has seen some huge improvements in their ability to be able to handle variable workloads. Um, over the past few, um, past three to six months, we've seen a huge pace of innovation in um, products such as Redshift to improve concurrency, burst capacity, um, improved automation and housekeeping um, activities such as resizing. So for relatively stable and consistent workloads, Redshift can provide a very cost-effective alternative um, to some SaaS solutions and provide a, um, a highly responsive uh, warehouse solution without too much of the management overhead um, uh, too much of the management overhead. The YBR processes ensure that you select the right tool for your job and avoid unexpected consumption um, um, outcomes into the future. And these are just examples of some of the trade-offs that we typically go through. So ultimately, what we're looking to do is to help um, our customers find a clear path to value. 
It typically starts off with, as mentioned, the data done done diagnostic to help us understand your business goals and better focus the opportunities that are in front of you to get your um, data and analytics into the cloud faster. We then work with you to build out the detailed yellow brick road to set the signposts and ensure the right outcomes are delivered for your business. We then aim to get your outcomes in production in as little as 13 weeks, um, as you'll see in the VIX use case um, shortly, and have you delivering business value um, almost immediately after deployment into production. Um, to demonstrate this, I'll um, now hand you over to Sean Langton from VIX Technology to discuss how VIX and Versant partnered um, recently to deliver a transformational data and analytics platform for their global transport customers. Over to you, Sean. Thanks, David, and uh, hello, everyone, and, and thanks for the opportunity to uh, speak today. So I'll tell you a little bit about VIX in case you don't know what we do or who we are. Um, the challenge that we uh, were facing, the solution we came up with, with and, and then a little bit about what it means for our customers. Um, so VIX is a leading um, provider of transport ticketing technologies. Automated fare collection is the other term that we use. So what that means is if you go and get on any kind of public transport network in one of our cities, when you tap your credit card or when you tap your um, transit pass to open the gate to get onto the, the rail platform, that device that you're tapping against is a piece of VIX hardware. And then behind the scenes, there's a, a huge back end um, processing system that processes all the payments, um, clearing and settlement, um, product rules, fare rules, customer information, etc. cetera. Um, so we're hardware and software. Um, we've been doing this for 30 years. Uh, we're in 200 cities in 10 countries around the world. And we operate at scale. So some of the biggest um, cities we've worked in, Hong Kong um, with the Octopus system, Beijing, New Delhi. Um, and then more recently, been working in a place like Manchester. Uh, we also support the Mikey system in Melbourne for those uh, closer to home. Uh, and we have projects in Brussels, Edmonton, Dallas, uh, and soon to be Phoenix. Um, now, one thing that's important to understand there is the scale that we operate at. So at our largest systems will process 9 billion transactions per annum. Um, that's the equivalent uh, or a bit more than all of the contactless or the um, card-based payments that flow through the Australian banking system. Um, so it gives you a sense of the scale of processing required. Um, we're a global engineering team um, headquartered in Perth. We've got engineers in Melbourne, uh, as well as in France, UK, Slovakia, and um, we've, we've won awards, so we're proud and we're known as an innovator in, in this kind of technology space. Um, a few years ago, we started down a journey of building a new software platform or software as a service platform that was cloud-based, we call that Pulse. Um, and that was just to regenerate our, our product architecture and move away from delivering highly bespoke solutions to our customers onto a standardized product platform. Um, and if, if we can just uh, flick to the next slide. Um, Around 12 months ago, when, when we started to talk to um, Vercent and face into this, we, we were live with a couple of customers, um, but the reporting components we built at that time were fairly rudimentary. Um, it limited our ability to do, do a couple of things. One, it really limited the ability to meet all of the requirements we had in our projects very, very quickly uh, and inexpensively. So feeding data off a transactional database um, with overnight kind of batch extracts and producing PDFs or crystal reports um, is, is fine for some operational reporting and some really basic kind of insights into what's going on. It's not going to scale to a 9 billion transactions per annum data set where you want to analyze trends um, and you know, really get kind of close to the data and really use the data to drive your system or drive your business. So it had its limitations. Um, the second thing that was important to us was we really see data and the data platform as kind of being at the heart of our, our future product strategy. Um, so the history of our industry, um, you know, at the start of the of VIX's sort of genesis was all about smart cards and the, the thing that you carry around. That was the system of record. Um, today, it's really the kind of core ticket processing engine and the, and the software. But going forward, all of the innovation and all of the um, smarts that are coming are all going to be based on data. So having access to a platform that has data fed into it in real time, that's inexpensive, is open, and makes that data available uh, is really, really important. 
so that was the challenge. Um, and if we click to the next slide, we'll talk a little bit about the, uh, the solution. So um, just, just to sort of build on what David said, really, I guess a couple of uh, things I'll note to start. One is, yeah, my personal history with data warehousing and BI projects is they're normally the opposite of what we experience here. They're normally very, very expensive, um, take you know, months, if not years, um, hundreds, if not millions of dollars to stand up the infrastructure before you get anywhere near to delivering value for your customers or for your um, internal users. Uh, and I've seen that play out over the last 20 years with lots of um, big infrastructure projects and big data projects that have a very long lead time to get to any kind of value um, and a, a difficult, often facing a lot of data quality issues as well. So the, the real benefit of what we, um, what we saw here was moving to cloud native. So we started the journey with Pulse as cloud-based, uh, which meant we were building an application to run in the cloud that could run on any cloud provider or on-premise uh, on a private cloud. What we changed tack and changed direction was become cloud native. We realized we were only ever deploying to AWS and there was a, a, a huge amount of value locked up in the native features of AWS. So as part of that switch, that allowed us to consider a fully serverless architecture for the data platform and all of the benefits that David described. Um, one, of the, one of the nice surprises I, I got in the first um, couple of months of the development of the product was getting the bill from Snowflake. Um, and literally the, uh, the monthly bill was less than I was spending on coffee in a month. Um, now, if you compare that to a traditional architecture, a traditional um, data project or big data project, you know, you'd be spending uh, five or six figures of just development infrastructure and lead time to stand that up. So, you know, to be able to turn this around in 13 weeks, and that for us included the, the Yellow Brick Road discovery phase uh, and do it at really low cost was very, very important. The, the other thing I'd stress um, in terms of the platform that we built was we didn't have to sweat the architecture decisions. So we went for the lowest cost, lightest weight um, tool we could find to meet the requirement. Um, and that, that assessment was quick. We did spikes, we did proof of concept, but we, we didn't overthink that. And the reason for that is because when you're moving at the pace that this project moved at, if we got a decision wrong, we could, we could always switch. So for example, we use QuickSight, which is a, um, a low cost AWS um, business intelligence tool or dashboard tool. Um, there are much more powerful tools out there that we considered, Tableau, Spotfire, there's, there's lots of them, Power BI. Um, but what we realized was QuickSight was good enough to get started and until we see a requirement that can't meet with it, it was perfectly fine. We didn't have to go and do a big long running assessment of all the best of breed tools to find the right architecture. By using this serverless, quick to start, low cost entry point technology, we were able to get up and running really quickly, really inexpensively and not have a really, really long discovery process. Um, and the other thing to note is we ran it with a, with a blended Vix and Vercent team. Um, and you know, Vercent really helped us kind of bootstrap the cloud native skill sets and um, brought the experience to the table. But part of the delivery was to, to skill up our team and um, get us to the point where we can, we can run the system standalone. So within 13 weeks, we got to the point where we had a, a fully fledged product uh, with production infrastructure, production data. We were um, showcasing it at, at trade shows in London um, 13 weeks after starting the engagement, um, which was really, really exciting. And if we can switch to the next slide, um, it's worth reflecting as well on uh, what that means for our customers. So, yeah, we know that the future is, is real time, never more so than, than right now. If you look at the, the typical customers that buy from us, their public transport agencies, they've just been massively disrupted by COVID. So, you know, almost overnight, their ridership dropped to zero. They have to manage costs. They still have to provide a service for essential workers, but they, um, you know, they can't afford to run the full service. Um, and then all, all of a sudden lockdown ends, um, you know, in some countries that's been an overnight announcement that everyone's going back to work the next day. And suddenly they've got to start provisioning not only a, a full service again, but they've also got to factor in things like social distancing on their, on their platform. So the importance of real-time insights and the ability to see what's going on on your network and to optimize it in real time has never been 
more important than it is right now. And, and yeah, some of the things that this platform is enabling us to talk to our customers about and offer are things like um, real-time passenger counters that can uh, apply kind of um, barriers in the event of a um, breach of social distancing or um, uh, distancing guidelines. Um, but you know, beyond that, it allows us to our customers to optimize um, their revenue products. It allows them to understand their costs and optimize that. Understanding passenger behaviors, use of different products, caps, all sorts of things like that. Beyond that, it is also a very open platform for our customers. So you know, typically we're implementing into environments that may have an existing BI tool set. Um, they may have a, a BI team. They may have a data warehouse that they want to ingest data into. So the architecture that we built, whilst we built a lot of um, out of the box reports and dashboards, we're also able to give customers the ability to build their own reports, um, bring their own um, BI tool sets, or just consume our data through the Snowflake API. Um, the other thing that the Snowflake API offers, which is really important to us, is very, very strong security. We, we deal with payment data, we're PCI compliant, and we deal with uh, personal information. So the strength of that um, access control and the fine-grained access control over the APIs means that we can do that very, very securely, which is incredibly important to our customers. And then finally, um, what it means for, for us really and our future customers is we're able to use data now as the um, kind of source of new innovation within VIX. So as we sort of build out our fair engines and our, our core products, we can make them smarter. We can use real-time data feeds to do Things like um, adaptive pricing, like surge pricing as you get on Uber, you could potentially build into our kind of fair rules um, should there be a need, or similarly offer discounts when you know that there's capacity on the network and you want to encourage people to use it. Um, we can start to build real-time analytics tools, provide data APIs through marketplaces, uh, and you know, we're moving into data science, artificial intelligence, machine learning as the next generation of tools and product innovation for VIX. Um, we'll move to the next slide and I'll just give you a couple of uh, examples. So when we um, showcased this, we loaded up 10 years worth of data from Stockholm. Um, we did that to see that the platform could handle 10 years worth of data. Um, and we started to look at what insights we could generate with different uh, data sets. So that, that first slide is showing the impact of different events. So if you can go back, back one. Um, that, so that big spike there that you see we correlated with some event data that showed that there was a band called Kent, who are very big in Sweden apparently, um, who had a concert in the, in the city that day. And you can see the impact that had on ridership. But you can also see the product that they're using. The different shades of green show different fair products. And you can see that that's nearly all students. If you, if you move to the right on March the 13th, there was also a concert, um, but a very different mix and a very different use of public transport. The same number of people attended that concert, I think it was Drake. Um, but very, very different profile and demographic. So it gives you a sense of the kind of insights that you can generate from this data. And then the next slide uh, is more of a product-based one. So uh, when the, um, the operator implemented different concession rules for students and seniors, you can see with that dip in the middle and then the, the rise, people switching from one product set to another uh, and the impact that that product rule change has had on ridership. So just a couple of um, quick, simple examples of the kinds of dashboards that we've been able to build. Um, and these are very, very quick and easy to produce. The product we've got now has around 70 dashboards in it um, that our, uh, live customers are, are using every day. Um, I'll hand to Phil, who's gonna show a quick um, visualization that we did on this data as well to give you a, a sense of what you can do with some uh, data science uh, resource. Thanks, Sean. So um, the QuickSight dashboards offered a, a great method to snapshot the data at points in time for analysis, but a, uh, a data scientist made the visualization over time more dynamic with TIBCO spot files showing how time series data can be made into more powerful narrative. So you can see those transactions are taps on the readers and the passenger types, the concession, student and adult. And the hotspots on the map are the reader locations, which show the biggest at the main station in Stockholm Central and uh, radiating out into the suburbs. And as you can see, the uh, peaks and troughs of use coincide with weekday commute patterns uh, with the quiet times on the weekends. 
So you can sort of note that the number here is all for 2016. More recent data can be overlaid with a COVID-19 data set that shows that basically Snowflake's provided free of charge, and that would show a very dramatic change in transit use as would be expected. I'll uh, hand back now to, uh, to David. Thanks, Phil. Uh, I'll just drop, sorry, just get this. So yeah, so as you can see, um, you know, some really interesting um, work there done at, uh, down, done at VIX. Um, what's sort of amazing about it is how quickly, as, as Sean mentioned, how quickly it all sort of came together and, um, and, 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 and what surprised me over, that, over the journey of it is just how well the team sort of came together to be able to deliver that outcome. Um, and it's something that, um, as someone who formerly worked in the transport industry, um, it's really, really um, enheartening to sort of see um, how innovation like that can be delivered for transport customers, given the importance of that um, for many, many communities that um, these transport networks actually serve. Um, so with that, we've sort of got a little bit of a, um, we're going to sort of transition over to question time. Um, um, so we'll open up to the audience um, if there are any questions and feel free to ask uh, myself, um, Sean or Phil, anything about um, either how we approach data or um, the VIX solution itself. Okay, we had our first question, which is uh, how long is a typical YBR process? Um, so maybe I'll take that one. So a typical YBR process tends to run um, anywhere between sort of four to eight weeks, depending on the size and the complexity um, of, I guess, what each organisation is looking to achieve. Um, some organisations tend to already have a little bit of a, a game plan as to what they want to achieve from their data platform. Um, and so some of those with with those types of customers we tend to sort of focus a little bit more on just bringing those um those goals to life others are still others are looking to be able to take i guess a bit more of a first principle approach as to what they want to do with data what their organization needs to achieve and some of those ybr processes um can take a little bit longer um, i guess the key point of it is that um, at first we try to be as flexible as possible and work in with our um, with our clients around their needs and specifically what they're trying to achieve. So, um, you know, we can, uh, we can help you whether you know what you want to do or whether you're still looking for those key use cases to be able to um, pursue over the course of the next few months. Okay, the uh, second question that came in, I believe, was from Stephen. Uh, Sean, how do you promote and engage with your target audience? Are you fortunate enough by reputation having customers come to you? Uh, yeah, yeah. Look, to a degree, our, our target audience or our, our customers are transit operators and agencies, which is, you know, there's a there's a fairly small and tight knit network of customers. Vix is well known and has a, a really strong reputation for the technology. So, yeah, the typical engagement, um, we do have trade shows and conferences that we typically showcase our products at. Um, but the other thing that's really important to us is referenceability. So, so having customers talk to each other. Um, typically, customers in our industry don't compete with it, each other. They're operating in different geographies. So they tend to um, talk to each other. And if you know, one has a good experience or um, has access to some great technology, um, such as Compass, um, word will tend to spread pretty quickly. And, and you know, we tend to hear through the, um, through the industry. All right. I've got a question also, uh, what is the daily volume of data you see going into the platform? I'm, I'm going to give a, ter a, a terrible consultant's answer, which is it depends. So um, we have um, some of our customers are in pilot and so the volumes are, are fairly low. Um, but as they ramp up, what we typically see, particularly when we launch um, contactless EMV, which is the ability to use a credit card or RefPost card to access um, transit, we see um, volumes rapidly rise. Um, so it really does depend on the customer and the size of, of their network. Um, but the, you know, the largest that we stress tested it with was the Stockholm 10 year data set that we um, uploaded. And I believe we were getting certainly into terabytes. I can't remember whether we reached kind of petabytes of data, but we certainly stressed that with the, the volume of data. I don't know if you know, Phil, the exact volume that we loaded and how long it took to load all of that. Oh, it was um, 
it was actually, to be honest, I think we pulled out nearly a billion, oh, not quite a billion, just un, actually just under a billion rows. I think it was loaded into Snowflake in under three or four minutes. So it was a fairly, a fairly quick time frame. Uh, I've got a question also, David, I see data lakes commonly being used as data dumps. How would you advise delivering data value from data assets for customers with or without a data lake strategy? It's a really interesting question. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think uh, swap was the common, was the, was the term most people used when uh, data lakes, uh, after the first sort of six to 12 months of actually implementing a data lake. Um, look, I guess, uh, in terms of how you deliver value without a data lake, I think ultimately what it, what it comes down to is understanding what you're trying to achieve out of the data. And I know that's a little bit of a, I guess, a trite answer, but um, as we sort of talked about during the start of the presentation, there are so many tools and there are so many processes and services available now to be able to explore and quickly um, tease out the insights from the data. Um, I, I think the best, um, Thing that most customers can do at the moment is is try to find um, what the value is in those data sets prove it out with whatever technologies they need to um, to do that quickly and in a very iterative fashion and then once they um, have a clear understanding of how they want to use that data how they want to apply that data within their business to either improve some operational outcome or to be able to impact the customer experience then um, then invest in scaling that insight um, and delivering that through a, a more, I guess, robust data platform. And for some use cases, that will mean that a data lake will be required and um, will, you know, will help significantly in reducing the cost and maintain the flexibility of the platform. For other um, use cases that are potentially doing simple things like integrating a few transactional data sets from across the business, um, there are other strategies that may work just as well, which is implementing some sort of an ODS um, um, and putting a BI layer over top of that. It, it all depends and it all comes down to the specific use case that each, um, that each customer is trying to achieve. Okay, I'm jumping around a little bit. Uh, how are we dealing with real-time ETL on the platform? I can probably take that one actually, because at the moment there isn't any. That's not to say there won't be downstream, but the current architecture basically supports uh, an ELT process where any transformation is being done in the Snowflake processing site. This was a, a conscious decision at the time also because the VIX engineering team uh, was more across SQL as a language for transformation as opposed to Python or something similar or Spark. So in the future, potentially we'll look across things like Glue uh, as a product to help transform on the fly, but at this stage we're using ELT and SQL. Snowflake. Yeah, I think just to extend that maybe a little bit, Phil, is that Glue, I think recently has just announced actually that there are um, that some real-time streaming capabilities and some transformation capabilities on that. But um, there are a number of also solution patterns that we can put in place um, that extend, I guess, what you would call a typically a more batch-oriented um, analytics architecture to real-time and whether that's using Kinesis to be able to capture events, perform some real-time transformations on that data and stream that data into um, some sort of inference engine or some sort of um, like intermediate um, compute engine. That's one option. Other options are um, using things like standing EMR clusters to be able to uh, get trans data and now glue as well. Um, the short answer is that there's many different approaches and what we've tried to do is patternize each one of those approaches. Um, and what we tend to deliver in terms of the baseline data platforms for our customers um, are easily extended to be able to slot in those new capabilities as required. Okay, I've got one here for Sean as well. Uh, who owns the customer data and have they given VIX specific, specific, specific permission? Yeah, absolutely. Good, good question. So um, VIX is a, effectively a managed services provider over these platforms for our customers, but the customer owns the data um, and yeah, absolutely gives us permission to, to um, show anonymized data like um, I've been showing today. Um, but yeah, obviously we have rights to operate and manage that data on behalf of our customers. The one thing um, I would kind of add um, that's kind of important in this respect is, you know, I talked about the, the move from being cloud-based 
to um, cloud native. What we're finding with our customers is that the concerns they had maybe four or five years ago were typically wanting to control the data center. You know, absolutely control where the data is, which data center provider we're using, or which cloud provider. Um, what we're seeing now is a very, very heavy focus on cybersecurity and PCI compliance. And that's the thing that really matters. So you know, a lot of the choices that we made around the architecture, um, particularly the choice of, of Snowflake and some of the processes we've had to go through with our customers have been very, very deep kind of cyber analysis of our architecture, our data security, um, our cyber controls. And um, yeah, we have to pass PCI accreditation um, for all of our platforms. So very, very important um, element of what we do and um, how we manage customer data. Okay, uh, a quick one I can probably answer on the side here. What type of data streams are input to the VIX data lake? At the moment, we're using uh, there's an Oracle uh, RDS uh, pushing data through uh, using CDC capture by DNS. Uh, we've also got uh, Kinesis agents running on the application servers, which is also pushing data through Kinesis. Um, downstream, there was a few other options. Uh, we're looking at something like um, Cassandra, for example, going down in, in there as well. Um, but for the time being, they're the two or three currently being used. There's a question here for Sean again. Uh, how does this solution support the broader VIX data strategy and uh, what's next? Yeah, this, this is really, um, as I said in, in the talk, really becoming our core um, platform for innovation, if you like. So if we see data as the new kind of currency and the, the unit that we're gonna be um, analyzing and um, generating value for our customers from, you know, this is really the platform. Um, in terms of, what's next we're looking at um, hiring a full-time data scientist um, in in coming months who will start to really explore the kind of rich data sets that we've got not only across our new customers on our new pulse platform we're also talking to a lot of our existing customers on some of our legacy platforms about how we might be able to leverage some of their um, data sets for them and just help them in different ways and you know, I don't think the next thing is gonna be one big thing. It's gonna be a series of tools, integrations, um, ways of uh, finding different, different forms of value for the customer, whether that's cost savings, whether that's insights into their product strategies and their fair rules, um, whether it's ways to optimize um, some of their operational processes, all of the above are available to us. Um, we're just talking to customers now about where they would like us to go with the product. Okay. We have a few more questions. Uh, David, are we, do we have enough time for the remaining ones? Um, uh, well, I guess I'm happy to go over. I guess we'll leave it up to the attendees as to whether they want to leave the session, but yeah, let's, let's go for it. Okay, uh, I have one here about real-time data streams. So basically at the moment, uh, we support, in terms of out of the box, we uh, ship all data to S3 via Kinesis and for ingestion into Snowflake for analysis. So. Data is available within minutes of being updated in source, which is the old TP Oracle RDS, all the application server logs. Um, using Kinesis as a staging uh, point for most sources, such as DMS and Kinesis logs, gives us the potential to inspect data at that point if we needed real-time capability, or push it to a dashboard so we could use or react to certain SLAs, such as card readers going down, for example. That's kind of thinking. I have another one for Sean. Uh, you're dealing with large volumes of data. Uh, you mentioned insights that you're looking to enable. How are you doing this? And do you have any customer examples that have led to change? Has there been any interesting insight across geographies as there must be commonalities? Um, yeah, the, the, the simplest insight is um, uh, cities realizing when their peak hour is and their rush hour. Um, yeah, when you think about it, most of our customers are coming out of a world where payments are made using cash. So there is really no record of who's riding, what um, buses at any point of time or in, in the day or how busy they are if they're overloaded, other than just empirical kind of hearsay. Um, so we did get insights from um, our customer in Manchester that as a result of using um, some of these technologies that they were able to work out that the peak hour and rush hour that they'd always thought was 8 p.m., sorry, 8 a.m. Uh, in the morning was actually closer to 7.30 uh, in the morning. So, you know, 
think about the ramifications and, and the impacts um, that that has. They also believe that they can determine whether Manchester United fans are actually all from Manchester by looking at the um, information around the card issuers um, or whether Manchester City are more Mancunians, which is a, a very controversial um, thing in the city of Manchester. And um, you, using the data for all sorts of kind of unexpected um, side effects and uh, insights. And um, yeah, I might just pick up, there's, a, there's another question there around augmentation of customer data because that's a, another area that we're increasingly uh, having to do is many, many of our projects collect lots of data sets from um, other fair collection sources, from um, real-time uh, vehicle information around the routes that they're taking. Um, and so the, you know, the more we load different data sets into this event data, weather data, the richer those insights become. And you know, the more we'll find you know, unusual patterns, surprises, changes, disruptions, and, and that allows us to manage disruptions, manage um, planning, etc. All right, and I've got one here also about the challenges there are in managing a federated security model across Snowflake and AWS. And um, <laughs> it's a very long answer to this one. Effectively, there's a number of challenges. Um, the first and foremost is PIA data and ensuring that all the regional data sovereignty laws are observed. And uh, given that VIX's data platform is multi-tenanted model, in multiple regions, we had to consider three components. There was the AWS environment in each region, which supports data pipelines for each customer. There was uh, the Snowflake account, also in each corresponding region that had multiple customers and users. And then you had the, uh, the packaged QuickSight dashboards as well. So the data pipelines in AWS maintained purely by VIX engineers. So it was federated with their corporate active directory using appropriate roles. This also meant, meant that transient data in S3 buckets uh, was uh, role-based access, using role-based access as well. As the Snowflake environments also had multiple customers and end users, uh, there was users and grants for fix engineers across only relevant databases and tables, whereas customers were granted reader accounts that only had access to appropriate secure views uh, and quick site users were set up as um, separately. So using a customer ID for integration was problematic given the number of separate customers sharing access to the same instance of the product. So that path wasn't possible. Okay, um, just conscious of time. Um, so thank you very much for questions. Thanks, Phil, for, for hosting that bit. Um, just uh, so, oh, here we go. We're just gonna get back control of the screen here. Um, so just, uh, just to round out the session, um, A, I wanna first thank everyone for attending. Thank you very much, Sean, for sharing your experiences with Fix. It was really, really um, interesting to hear from your perspective, how the program um, um, ended up and, 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 the, uh, and the benefits it delivered to fixed business. Um, I want to thank you everyone else on the call for making the time for this session. And as promised, um, here is the link that will be active um, in the next uh, day or so. Um, if you are interested in, um, in, in talking to us about how to kick up your own um, data done done journey, um, visit the link that's on the page there and um, one of our team will um, take some time to sort of sit down and work, um, work through how we can um, either help get a data diagnostic underway or um, potentially how we can sort of take the next step and um, help deliver your um, platform shortly. Okay. Thanks, David. Thanks, Sean. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, guys. See you.